Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's service. Uh, just a, a warm welcome to you, and thank you so much for joining us uh, today on our third Sunday of Easter. So we're going to begin our service this morning by lighting the Christ candle. And so Claire's going to light the candle for us while, uh, while we bow our heads in prayer. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you that even in the midst of difficulty and chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, you are here with us. And we thank you that your light shines and that your hope prevails. We pray that you would be with us this morning as we share in the service together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just as we start our service this morning, I want to give a little shout out to Tash um, and say thank you to her for the children's uh, videos that she's been putting out. So even if you don't have kids, I'd really recommend that you uh, go onto our website or onto the Wesley Facebook page and find the link there and have a look at those uh, lessons that she's prepared. Um, just, just really good and it would be awesome if you could do that. So as I mentioned earlier in the prayer, Today is the third Sunday in Easter, and one of the very traditional passages that we read during this time is, comes from Luke chapter 24, and uh, we read today from verses 13 to 35, which is an account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And this morning, Steph is going to be doing the reading for us. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. 
Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. So thank you, Steph, for that reading uh, this morning. Um, Luke has this wonderful way of using travel stories in his book. Just about every big development that happens in Luke involves some kind of road or journey. So we see with the nativity, um, the nativity starts with a trip that Joseph and Mary have to make to Bethlehem. Even in Jesus' parables, he, he uses stories about roads and travel. So the Good Samaritan happens um, as one person is trying to travel somewhere. The, the story of uh, the prodigal son is about someone journeying away um, to a distant land and then coming back to the father by a road. Um, even as Luke tells the story of Jesus, Jesus sets his sights on Jerusalem and the cross and begins to travel there from chapter 9 and spends all the way from, from chapter 9 all the way through to chapter 19 getting to Jerusalem. Just one epic journey as he gets there. Even later in Acts, when Luke is, is writing about the early church um, and Paul's conversion, well, where does it happen? It, it happens on a journey to Damascus. So these roads are just a, a very rich and, um, I think, powerful image uh, for us. And I want to just stop us there for a moment and, um, and, and ask you, what road are you on at the moment? What journey are you taking currently? Where's the road that you are on ultimately leading you to? So roads are exciting. They offer the opportunity of new destinations, new possibilities. I suppose roads can also be threatening and, and dangerous. Um, as I think about some of the roads that we could currently be on, um, I, I can remember in my, in my 20s getting into some situations and suddenly thinking, thinking to myself, how on earth did I get here? What, what crazy decisions and choices did I have to make to end up here? Um, I'm getting to the age now where some of the journeys I take, I, I don't know why, why I'm there. Like I'll go through to the kitchen and open the cupboard and um, I can't remember why it is that, uh, that I got there or what it is I'm looking for. I think for many of us at the moment, the road we're on now is this mysterious road. I suppose quite a scary road. A road of, of where we just don't know where it leads to. Um, we... We don't really know what tomorrow holds. Funny how a crisis can do that, um, make us suddenly realize that we aren't in control of anything. We aren't even in control of what will happen to tomorrow. I think the road that I'm currently on for myself is this road of disappointment. Um, I'm feeling a bit like uh, every little thing I planned or everything I I hoped for just isn't going to be anymore and this picture keeps coming to mind of an advert that used to be on TV a while ago of this kid that leaves the ice cream shop and um, he, his ice cream falls off his cone and plops on the sidewalk um, and bursts into tears. Um, I'm feeling a bit like that. These disappointments are making me want to throw a bit of a tantrum. You know, we, we've all hoped for so many things. We, we hoped for various things for our businesses. We, we hoped um, in 
various cash projections. Uh, some of us hoped in covering uh, parts of the school syllabus by now, uh, but none of these things are already happening. For, for me, I had hoped that we would have started renovations on the church, uh, but that hasn't happened. One of my big disappointments is that we had hoped as a family to go to Cape Town. We had been planning for it for months, just desperately hoped to, to get away somewhere with, with our family. We had set the itinerary, made our plans, bought the tickets, got accommodation sorted, and now we just, we just can't do that. Just these lost things. Uh, so the roads or the journeys that we're on, at some level, I think they, they speak about what we are hoping for. And so again, I, I want to ask you that question, what road are you on? And where are you hoping that that destination would end up at? What is your dream? So these roads, I think these journeys, these things we hope for, I think a bit like the two disciples journeying on the road to Emmaus, we have a similar problem in that our hopes are too small. Um, uh, uh, the things that we desire and we dream of, they're a bit too confined to our own, I suppose, self-centered perception of what it is that God's doing. I think that we, like those two disciples who are on the road to Emmaus, need an encounter with God to rediscover that the hope that we should have is a hope in God that prevails. So the world we live in, we might come under this perception that evil reigns, that it is evil that prevails. But what we really need to see, or we, what we need God to help us rediscover, is that our hope should be placed in Him, because God prevails. At various points in our human history, there have been many times when we have felt that this evil we currently live under will just be here forever. But in the end, Nero, um, the pharaohs, slavery, the Nazi regime, apartheid, we might have felt like those would, in the moment would just last forever. But they don't prevail. It is God that prevails. So we need to remember that the road we are on, it's not just our road. It is, it is a road that God sets before us. It is a journey that God is in control of. So the scene that we come across in Luke as these two people are journeying towards Emmaus, I've never really thought about it this way, but it's actually set on the same day that the women discover the empty tomb. So here we have these two disciples who are on this journey of despair away from Jerusalem. They, they're on this long 11-kilometer trek away from Jerusalem to Emmaus, with their, with their hearts downcast and their dreams shattered on the same day that Christ is risen. So there they are, lost in despair, while there is a risen Christ. And it's because they just can't see beyond the limited hope that they had had. You see, I think at some level, they had hoped that Jesus would overthrow the oppressors right away. That, that Rome would fall and uh, that the Israelite people would rise. I think at some level, they were hoping that if, if they were part of this Jesus group and Jesus rose to power, that they would rise to power with him. But now... All those hopes that they had, all those limited, finite hopes, they, they are dashed because in their mind, Jesus is dead and they are outlaws. And the only thing they can hope for now is to escape the authorities, to not uh, be crucified themselves. So all their dreams are dashed. And as they speak to Jesus, they even say these words, oh, how we had hoped. And maybe you've been saying some of those words yourself in the last couple of weeks. Oh, how I had hoped. And 
I just love it because as they make that exclamation, oh, how we had hoped, Jesus needs to show them that they've lost their hope, but there is something even better than what they hoped for that is now a reality. They just can't see it yet. So they don't, they don't know at the time, but this stranger that meets them along this road on their journey is actually Jesus. And as he speaks with them, he just does something so beautiful with them. He, he, he speaks to them, asking them questions, but then also, I think, reorientating their hope. He, and he does this by going back through the scriptures, retracing the story of God. And he goes back through all the, all the prophecies, all the promises that God made. He, he shows them the, the evil that prevailed at various times and the way that God saw the people through that. But more than that, how there is this thread, the story of, of God working through all of this. And that it all comes to, to a climax in Jesus himself. And he tries to make them see again that all the things that Jesus had spoken about, now they will come to be. That Jesus wasn't just a teacher or a rabbi, but that he was the very son of God. And he came to accomplish forgiveness of sins, uh, death of death. And those things are now accomplished. So he pretends, and I, and I love this imagery, Jesus pretends to be journeying further uh, it's, it's just this picture again that the journey you've chosen is too limited. It's too small. You need to be able to see bigger than that. But they ask Jesus to wait and, and stay with them. And, and then just as he sits and he eats with them uh, and he breaks that bread, he reveals who he is. And they begin to get a glimpse of what might be going on here. And then in wonderful storytelling, uh, in, in, a, in a wonderful move of storytelling, just as they see, just as they understand, then Jesus disappears from their sight. And I'm so glad that there were two of them, because I think if there was only one, um, that person might have thought to himself, well, maybe I was just imagining all of this. Um, but there are two of them. So Jesus disappears, and they, they look to each other, and they suddenly say, could it be? Um, was that Jesus himself? Has he done all the things he said he would do? Didn't our hearts burn inside of us as he, as he spoke and as he reorientated or restored our hope again? Isn't that what Jesus is doing on each of our journeys? Isn't that what each of us needs is for our hope to be reorientated? For God to show us in some way that the journey we thought we were on actually isn't the journey, that there is something bigger at work here. So if we go back to Luke's gospel and all his stories of, of journey taking, um, we see the things that the various characters were hoping in, and then we see that there was actually something much more that God was doing in the background. So Mary and Joseph, they're not just traveling to Bethlehem to attend a census. They're not just hoping to find accommodation. Uh, in the end, they're going to Bethlehem to, to be part of the birth of the Messiah. Paul isn't just journeying to Damascus, hoping to catch some Christians. He's journeying to Damascus to be caught by Christ. Maybe as we journey through lockdown, we aren't just going into lockdown, hoping to escape a virus. Maybe there's something bigger that God's doing within our hearts, within our families, and within our communities that we just don't really fully imagine or understand yet. But we need to trust that God is doing something big in the background. And we need to find ways of seeing what God is doing. So, back to these two travelers. They aren't just to travelers anymore who were disciples of a, of a very uh, important and influential rabbi, um, 
hoping to get to Emmaus to escape persecution or to be found by the authorities. No, now they are witnesses of the salvation of God. They are witnesses to the saving act of, of the Son of God himself. So their journey completely changes as their hope is reorientated. Um, they, they, as they suddenly see um, in good Luke storytelling fashion, what do they do? Well, um, they hit the road. They're back on a journey. And this time, they are, I don't think, walking slowly and forlorn. They, they're excited. They're, they're overjoyed. They now have a, have a message of hope within them. And they aren't rushing away from Jerusalem. They're running back to Jerusalem to bring this message of hope to others. So to, to close off, uh, uh, I want to close off with just some reflection. Um, I want to ask you, what are some of your hopes that have been dashed recently? And can you begin to see the working of God behind those shattered expectations or hopes that you had? One of the beautiful things that has happened for me in this time is I've come to realize that um, what I was hoping for was a, a, a nice holiday to a beautiful place with my family. Um, but really, what I was hoping for was a time to connect with my children and with my wife. Um, and wow, we, God's given us that big time, you know, locked in a house together for a whole month. Um, so there's, there's just always something, or not always, but I, th I think quite often we can find something good that God is doing in the background. I'm sorry to say, but as we go forward, I think our journey holds quite a few more disappointments in store. I don't think we're at the end of the sacrifices that are going to be made and the difficulties that we're going to have to endure. Um, for instance, I don't think that it's going to be, uh, uh, well, I think it's going to be still quite a while before we are able to come together again as a church. Um, I know that there are going to be salary cuts for many. Um, there are so many of us who are going to have to uh, lose our jobs. Um, and we really need to start thinking about how we can be God's love to others during this time. But even as we endure these things, I want to remind us not to get stuck in our limited perception of what's going on around us. Don't get stuck in, your, in, in our short-term um, journey. We need to realize that God's journey goes beyond ours and that God's plan always prevails. Not even... A, a, a worldwide lockdown can stifle the plan that God has for his world and for his people. So as we close off, um, I want to, instead of closing off in a prayer, I'd like to leave us with a couple of questions just to reflect on um, and to, to think through in this next week. And as we reflect on them, I, I hope that Jesus himself, the risen Christ, would come and meet with each of us, would heal us where we need healing, and would restore our hope where we need restoration. So I just leave us with these questions.
And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.